morning and welcome to worship. Luke 24, verses 1 to 6. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Let's worship our risen Lord and Savior together as we sing, My worth is not in what I own, and see what a morning.
In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, good morning and welcome to this time of worship on this Resurrection Sunday. Our call to worship this morning comes from the, from the words of Revelation chapter 1 where Jesus said, I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And gracious Lord Jesus, almighty God, as we gather here and worship again with your church around the world, we celebrate that you are indeed the first and the last, the living one, the one who has died, the one who rose from the dead, never to die again. And you reign in majesty and glory, Lord Jesus, having conquered death and the grave and sin. And we thank you, Lord God, that being raised in victory, that we too were raised with you And we thank you for the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. As we worship today, Lord God, may our hearts be filled once again with the wonder of the grace of our Savior. And we pray, Lord God, Holy Spirit, that as you speak, our hearts would be open to receive, that our minds would be illumined and enlightened by the wonder of the holiness, the majesty, the justice, and the grace and compassion of our God. And as we worship, Lord Jesus, come, surround us, Fill us, keep us, that we may worship free from distraction, free from disruption, and free from temptation to the praise of of your glorious name, Jesus Christ, the risen one. Amen. Friends, our help is in the name of the Lord our God who made the heavens and the earth. And now grace to you and peace from God our Father and his Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue in worship together as we sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus speaks to his disciples saying, this is what is written, the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day, 
and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Let's bow our heads together as we seek the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ in the confession of our sins. Gracious Lord Jesus, we indeed thank you that the gospel of repentance and forgiveness has been preached and is continually being preached in all nations throughout the world. We thank you, Lord God, that you have applied this gospel of repentance and forgiveness to our lives. For all those who have surrendered to you, Lord Jesus Christ, have experienced your grace and the forgiveness of their sins and now live in a state of grace. And you continue to call out, Lord Jesus, to all those who have yet to come into your kingdom, who have yet to surrender to you. But you extend them grace, Lord God, and you extend them mercy and kindness calling them into your life. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray for them as well that they would indeed surrender. But we are also conscious, Lord Jesus, that our lives are not yet what they should be. For we often sin against you and against those around us in the things that we do and the things that we say, in the thoughts that we allow to play out in our heads, in the things that we have done, and in the things that we have left undone. In all these things, Father, we see our failures, but we thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your victory is applied to all of these, and your grace washes them all away. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that indeed you would wash away all our sins and shortcomings that you would correct our flaws, Lord God, and we thank you that you have given us all that we need to live lives of godliness, lives that are pleasing to you. So continue then also, Lord Jesus, your gracious work of transformation in our lives, that we would continue to become all that you are recreating us to be. And as our lives shine more and more with the light of Jesus Christ, may that indeed be a testimony to the world around us, Lord God, a testimony of your grace of your truth, of your mercy and compassion seen in the transformation of our lives. And we pray that you would receive all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God assures us of his grace as we read from John chapter 1 where John writes, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Friends, this is the good news of God's grace given freely and abundantly in Jesus Christ. Be set free to live in his peace. Amen. And a word of instruction, turning back to Jesus' final words to his disciples, in Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. May God bless the reading of his holy word to our hearts and to our minds. Amen. Let's continue in worship together as the choir comes up.
Good job, guys. Thank you. And the, Thank ad you. And the adults did okay, too, right? <laughs> no, many, many thanks to Bert and Mary Beth and the whole choir for helping us in worship today. I'm squishy. You're squishy? Is that better? No. <laughs> uh, so I brought something to show you this morning. But it's pretty tiny. Is it a seed? No, it's not. No, it's not a rock. What is it? A seed. It's a seed. A seed grow. Yeah. So before Jesus went to the cross, uh, he was he was in the temple one day, and there were a couple of people uh, that said to one of his disciples, "We want to see Jesus." And so they went and told Jesus, they, "There's a couple of people here that they'd really like to see you." And Jesus said something really strange. Instead of saying, you know, oh, yeah, well, I'll bring them in, he said, unless a grain of wheat or a seed falls into the ground and dies, it doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything. It's, it's useless. It doesn't bear any fruit. And so this is, this is a seed, and it, doesn't, it won't do anything unless I plant it in the ground and water it and give it some sunshine and then when it's, it's like an apple seed. no, it's actually a Rosa Sharon seed. Uh, and then when it comes up, this produces uh, it can produce quite a large, quite a large tree. And if this tree bears, if this tree bears, let's say this tree bears a hundred flowers on it in the summer. That's a lot. That's, That's a, a lot. lot. How about that? one billion? And then, and then each each flower. Each flower produces a seed pod, and if that seed pod produces just 10 seeds, how many seeds is that? How many? You, can, how much? A trillion. That's right. It's a thousand. Flowers on and so, the tree. And so if, one trillion. So if you, were, if you were to leave this tree alone, and it would drop a thousand seeds onto the ground around it, in a few years, you'd have a forest, and it would just a it would just forest? keep it would just keep producing thousands and thousands of more seeds every year, right? And so this is what Jesus was talking about. He said he was saying, "I am the seed, and unless I unless I die, so unless Jesus dies and goes to the grave, so he's planted, so to speak, in the ground." He says, "If I don't die." I won't produce the fruit that is you and you and you and everyone else in the whole wide world who has become a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, unless I die for the forgiveness of sins and rise again, I won't produce any fruit. And so this is why Jesus is called in the Bible the first fruits of those who are born from the dead. Now, not physic we don't physically die uh, <clears throat> when we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but we come to life because we're, in a sense, we're already spiritually dead because of, uh, of our sinfulness, but Jesus brings us to life. Now, if I plant this seed, it will be completely destroyed. It will split open, and another sprout will come out, and even, even the shell that is around the seed will eventually decompose into the ground and you won't find it anymore. But in its place would be a beautiful flowering bush that produces more and more every year. And this is what we're supposed to do then too as followers of Jesus. That's why Jesus said, go out into all the world and make disciples so that you, <clears throat> that you produce more fruit and more fruit to the glory of Jesus. Even so, how about we how about we pray about that, and ask that Jesus would help us to produce uh, that Jesus would produce more and more fruit in us. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your grace and the forgiveness of our sins. And the forgiveness of our sins. And help us each day. And help us each day to find ways. To tell more and more people 
about your wonderful love and grace. About your wonderful love and grace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, off you go. Back in 2004, when Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, came out, I mean, it caused such an uproar that you, you, it was inescapable. I mean, it was everywhere. Uh, Christian groups were upset about this film. Jewish groups were upset about this film. Hollywood was upset about this film. It's like, it seemed like the whole world was upset about this film. Uh, it was, I don't know if anybody, I don't know if, how many of you have seen it. Uh, it it's, it's a film in which Gibson uh, did his best with some artistic license to detail the last 12 hours of the life of Jesus Christ, including his crucifixion. Uh, it was filmed completely in Aramaic with English subtitles, so maybe that kept some people from watching it because you had to read everything on the bottom of the screen. Uh, it, was, it was upsetting uh, because Jewish people thought it was anti-Jewish, because they, uh, they saw the film and they, thought, and they said, well, it didn't portray them in a very uh, positive light with the death of Jesus Christ and, and all of the Jesus interactions with, uh, with the Jewish uh, religious institution of the day. A lot of Christian groups loved it. In fact, churches were buying up blocks of tickets so their members could go and see it and support the film. Uh, other, other people got upset. Well, I mean, Holly, um, Gibson produced it using his own money because Hollywood didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. And even, even the actor, the main actor, Jim Caviezel, who played the character of Jesus Christ, uh, people were telling him, don't take this role, it's going to end your career. Uh, which it didn't, uh, but that's neither here nor there because Mr. Caviezel himself was a committed follower of Jesus Christ, so... He felt that it was his calling to take this role. Uh, a lot of people were upset about it because of the ghoulish brutality that he depicted in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and Gibson did not shy away from this at all. Uh, the thorns, the beatings, the whips, uh, it was all shown in gory Detail, including, including uh, Jesus hanging on the cross. And I think one of the most profound scenes in the movie is uh, one in which Jesus is being nailed to the cross and you don't, you, all you see is, is a hand holding the nail and a hand holding the hammer uh, and Gibson did that himself uh, as a very uh, poignant display of uh, you know, I am kind of the one, one of the ones responsible for putting Jesus on the cross. And so he wanted his hand to be the hand holding the nail and the hammer that drove Jesus' uh, hand into the cross. I mean, crucifixion, aside from, aside from the, the beatings and, uh, and the soldiers with the crown of thorns and, and all of that, aside from that, crucifixion, uh, it... Like, I don't know if there's a more torturous way to die. It could take, depending on how you did it, uh, and the Romans were noted for their cruelty, depending on how you did it, it could take anywhere from hours to days to die this way. And so it's just absolutely horrific. And the spectacle of it all, it was done very publicly as in Jesus and the two criminals being crucified with him and the crowd that were surrounding there and watching and the soldiers casting lots for Jesus' clothing, it was, uh, it was quite the public spectacle. 
I didn't see it when it came out in the theater. I waited till it came out on video. <laughs> and, and seeing it on the small screen was bad enough. But I wonder, like, how many of us have, have contemplated the incredible physical suffering that Jesus endured in order to satisfy God's justice. When you think about, you know, this man having been up a week for more than 24 hours at this point, being physically beaten, the whip would have done horrible things to his back, the blood loss, the exhaustion, and then having to carry the crossbeam of that cross up the hill or partway up the hill to Golgotha, you can understand why he would collapse under the weight of it and somebody else needed to carry it. It's awful. I'd like to think that nobody today would countenance the suffering of an innocent person for something that they did wrong. I'd like to think that. But then I see things like mixed martial arts and ultimate fight championship, and it's like, yeah, we're still, we still have a lot in common with the Romans and watching these gladiators beat themselves to death and call it sport. But as dark as that day was, we go through the darkness of that day because we know that there's a greater day coming. We know that there's a greater day that did come. And that's why one of the reasons why we're here, not just today, but every Sunday, because the greater day has come, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's a greater day that's yet to come that changes how we live our lives. And that's what we're going to dig into a little bit this morning as we open up our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 25. And as you're turning those pages, which I encourage you to do, uh, I'm just going to pray for us for a few moments. Almighty God, we pray once again that your holy and inspired word would be our teacher and that your Holy Spirit would be our guide, and that the honor and glory of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, would be our sole concern. Amen. Isaiah chapter 25, reading verses 1 through 9. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have accomplished wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. For you have turned the city into a pile of rocks, a fortified city into ruins. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will honor you. The cities of violent nations will fear you. For you have been a stronghold for the poor person, a stronghold for the needy in his distress, a refuge from storms and a shade from heat. When the breath of the violent is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry land, you will subdue the uproar of barbarians. As the shade of a cloud cools the heat of the day, so he will silence the song of the violent. On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all the peoples a feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine, On this mountain, he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day, it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> In 
if you take any lesson away from today, let it be this, that you live your life in the light of this, the greatest day that is yet to come in Jesus Christ. The prophet, I mean, especially Isaiah, but all the prophets, especially Isaiah, uh, they lived their lives looking at four horizons. They saw the, the immediate horizon in which they lived, and, and Isaiah prophesied judgment upon the people of God because of all the things that they have done and rebelling against God and worshiping idols and defiling uh, the land that God has given them and so on and so on. Isaiah lives in this immediate context of a people that are, are, are faithless, of a people that are apostate against the God who gifted them the land, the God who constituted them as a nation. But not only does he see that immediate context of the day in which he lives, but he also sees the day or the horizon in which the judgment that he speaks in forth telling the word of God, thus says the Lord, as often on the prophet's lips, about how God loves his people, how God created them to be holy and a jewel in, in the land, and so forth. He also sees that day when the words of his judgment because of their sinfulness will come to pass. And it could be far distant into the future because God is patient. He begins this a portion of Isaiah 25 by saying, Look, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have accomplished wonders uh, plans formed from long ago with perfect faithfulness. And he speaks to the Lord who is the true stronghold of his people because this God is a covenant-keeping God. And so God, from long ago, covenanted with his people. Even in Adam and Eve, our first parents, even in their sin, God covenanted with them, saying to them, yes, you're going to be punished for the sin and the rebellion that you have just committed. However, along with all of that, pain and hard work and hard labor that will come where once life was easy and good, along with that will come the promised deliverance. Or he says to Eve, for out of you, one of your children shall be the one who crushes the serpent's head and brings restoration to all things. And so Isaiah sees the horizon, that second horizon of, uh, of God's judgment coming to pass on the people because of their sinfulness because he can see that God is a faithful God and a covenant-keeping God, the God who said, if you keep my commands, I will bless you. If you defy me, I will punish you. But there's a third horizon that he also sees, and that is the horizon of Jesus Christ. Now, Isaiah comes hundreds of years before Christ. Hundreds. The northern, when the kingdom of Israel was split in two after the death of Solomon because of Solomon's sons, because of Solomon's own sin, the northern ten tribes in 722 went into captivity to Assyria. The southern two tribes, 150 years later, 586 went into captivity in Babylon because of their sin. At that point, we're still almost 600 years from the birth of Jesus Christ. And so hundreds of years before he actually came, Isaiah saw the horizon of Jesus Christ and he could prophesy restoration. Yes, Judgment will come, but yes, so will restoration. So will God make everything right once again. And then the fourth horizon that he sees is the horizon that we also look to. And that is the final return of Christ. The horizon which we see in this text that we're looking at this morning 
<clears throat> because God is the true stronghold of his people. So he praises this covenant-keeping God, the God who has accomplished wonders because of his plans formed long ago. Thousands of years before redemption would take place in Jesus Christ, God already promised his people that it would. Yes, you sin today. Yes, I'm kicking you out of the Garden of Eden today. Yes, life is going to become a lot harder than it was and want, I wanted it to be. However, it's not always going to be this way. And so he praises this covenant-keeping God who planned long ago to do all these things. In the immediate context, he's also preaching about the return of the people from captivity. He says, you have turned the city into a pile of rocks, a fortified city into ruins. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. And he's not talking necessarily about a particular city, but the city, the image of the city has become an image that represents everything and everyone that defies God. Cain was the first builder of cities. Cain, the one who killed his brother Abel, Cain, the one who was forever marked as an enemy of God, Cain, the one who built himself a city to protect himself from other people, but also as, as a legacy to his pride and sinfulness. Look at what I have done. And so the city becomes a symbol for, for wealth and power. And it's, it's, it's still, it's no wonder that people are still attracted to the big cities of today. I'm not saying cities are evil because there's a lot of evil that takes place in the rural communities too. But people are attracted to the big cities. Why? Because, of, well, there's more opportunity there. I can get a better job there. I can make more money there. Except for today, it's a lot more expensive to live there. And so on and so on. And there's a lot of beautiful things that take place in the city. Arts and culture and, and all kinds of good things take place there too. But Isaiah is using the imagery of the city to talk about that wealth and power, that anti-God attitude that people have. They display their pride through the building of cities it was the same attitude that Babylon had, that Assyria had when they came against God's people and, uh, and, and the arrogance that they displayed in doing so. Your God can't save you. Look at all the nations that I've conquered. Look at all the peoples, peoples that I've subjugated. You will just be another one in the long line of people that I have conquered that become a legacy for these pagan kings whose only design was to conquer the entire earth and build themselves a legacy in the city as a fortress of barbarians. The imagery of the city that was wealth and power then would also become a symbol of oppression because people looked to it as a stronghold and it was in certain, in certain degrees. We, we, look at, we look at the city of Jericho, the first city that the people of God encountered when they came into the promised land and how uh, its walls were so thick that multiple chariots could ride side by side across the top of the wall. And yet what happened to it? The people of God didn't throw one rock. They didn't cast one spear, they didn't build any siege works, they simply marched around the city seven days, and at the end of that final seventh march, on the seventh day, raised a great shout, and God brought the walls down. God destroys the stronghold and the fortress of barbarians so that it's no longer a city and that it's never going to be rebuilt and he does so as a testimony of his greatness so that a strong people, the people that think they're strong, will honor you and the cities of, violence, the cities of violent nations will fear you because he is, God is the true stronghold for the poor person, a stronghold for the needy in his distress, a refuge from storms and a shade from heat. 
Jesus comes as the one who is the true stronghold of his people. We can, uh, we can invest our entire lives building a legacy for ourselves. And in the famous words of Solomon in the song of uh, in Ecclesiastes, it says it's all vanity. It all comes to nothing. You die and hand over your entire worldly wealth to somebody else. And you have absolutely no control over what they do with it. Because you can't take it with you. There's an old joke, you've probably heard it, about a husband who, uh, who gave his wife explicit instructions you know, when I die, pack the casket with all my worldly wealth. It's like, okay, dear. And when he did finally die, the wife dutifully wrote a check, placed it in the casket, and that was it. You cannot take it with you. Whatever legacy you want to build here will come to nothing unless Jesus Christ is your true stronghold. All the protections that the world can offer cannot save you from your spiritual condition. All your striving, all your fighting, all your drive for success comes to nothing, spiritually speaking. Your true stronghold is Jesus Christ because he has brought all of these fortresses to nothing because he's the one who's a stronghold for the poor person, a stronghold for the needy in his distress, a refuge from storms and a shade from heat. The breath of the violent is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry land. But Jesus, he says, you will subdue the uproar of barbarians as the shade of a cloud cools the heat of the day so will Jesus silence the song of the violent. There's a certain irony here that when Jesus on Palm Sunday is riding up to Jerusalem, <clears throat> he doesn't say, he doesn't say, oh Israel, Israel, how I long to gather you around me under as a hen, as a mother hen gathers her chicks. He says, oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he talks to the city. And in other places, he says, you who kill the prophets and stone those that are sent to you. Even this city that was supposed to be the most sacred of cities had turned against God and turned to their own ways and to their own pride and to their own strength and to their own power which came to nothing at the cross. Because Jesus Christ alone is the true stronghold. But then the prophet turns and he says, but on this mountain, on this mountain, out in the open, for all to see. And Jesus was crucified on the mountain, on the temple mount. That temple with its golden dome that was, was, was so glorious that it could be seen from many, many kilometers away, out in the open, there on that hill called Golgotha, Jesus is crucified. And on this mountain, God says, the Lord of armies will prepare for all peoples a feast of choice meat a feast with aged wine, prime ch cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine. On this mountain, he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. 
Doesn't this sound an awful lot like what God says in the final book of the Bible in Revelation? That God will wipe away the tears from every face. On that day, death will finally be put down forever. The horizon that the prophet is looking to is the horizon of Jesus Christ and all that will come to pass because of his life and death and resurrection. Jesus himself says before he goes to the cross in that final meal with his disciples, he refuses to drink that last cup. He says, I won't drink this cup again until what? Until I come in the fullness of my kingdom and we will celebrate together the wedding feast of the Lamb and his church. On that day, on that day, this will be a feast for all peoples. On that day, the scene of revelation will come to reality when people from all tribes and tongues and nations are gathered around that table. And all who bow the knee to Jesus Christ will be welcomed there. A feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine, Chateau Lafitte, 1869. I hear it's the most expensive bottle of wine in the entire world. Maybe if we pooled all of our resources together, we could afford it together. I would keep it at my house. <laughs> Just for security reasons. <laughs> or we could, all, we could all sip from a thimble and have a taste of it. The, the, there, there's not enough words that Isaiah can pile up to describe the beauty and the wonder of that day. It's a day that we long for. It's a day that we long for on the worst days that we have when we turn and, 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 and turn in at the end of the day and think, man, Jesus can't come soon enough. I've had enough. I can't have another day like this. We look forward to that on this mountain. There will be such a spread set out for the people of God that there will be satisfaction finally because God will restore all things. On this mountain, he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all peoples, the sheet covering all the nations, the veil that means death, the face covering that people would put over their faces when they were mourning, the face covering that people would shroud the dead in. Jesus destroys that burial shroud forever. He takes it away so that our sight is restored and we can see him for who he is and see our great need of his grace and salvation. He did that at Calvary, and he will do it finally and completely when he comes to gather his people to himself. It will be destroyed because he has destroyed death forever, and the Lord God wipes away every tear from every face and removes his people's disgrace the disgrace that the world looks upon followers of Jesus with, the cynicism, the skepticism, the scorn, the mockery, all of that will be removed. And Jesus has already said in the Newer Testament, you will reign with me in the new heavens and the new earth because death has been destroyed forever. On that day, it will be said, Look, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. For Isaiah, that day hadn't come yet. Isaiah wouldn't live to see that day in a physical reality. 
He lived to see that day in a spiritual reality for he saw the horizon of Christ and he saw the horizon of Christ's return, that, that, that new kingdom prepared for God's people. But he didn't see it as a physical reality. And you may not either, but that's not the point. The point, as Isaiah says, on that day, it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. We're like Saturday people. Between the first coming of Jesus Christ and his life and death and resurrection, and we're like the Saturday people between Good Friday, waiting for that consummation of Christ's return. And it's hard, isn't it? The waiting? You see, I see, I see a world that's that's uh, that, that's angry and hate-filled, and anxious, and fearful. And sometimes I'm that way too. Sometimes it looks as though evil is winning the day. I, I naively thought racism had been conquered. But in the last 10 years, it's reared its ugly head again, and again, and again. And even within the church. In a previous church, in a previous church, uh, I, had, uh, I had been contacted by a colleague and, and he had been working with this young man and he was, he was hours away and so he said, hey, if I, if I send this young man who's close to you, would you give him, would you give him this money and, and I'll pay you back? I was like, sure, no problem. So the young man showed up after church one day and I sat down and had some conversation with him, but I heard somebody else in the church say, what's he doing off the reservation? I was like, Seriously? I thought naively that I would live to see a day when all people were treated equally. But it's not today. I thought I would live to see a day when war would be done because we have been so enlightened as a society of human beings that it would be completely inconceivable for one nation to rise up against another just because they wanted their land. I thought naively that I would live to see a day when there would be peace between Israel and the rest of the Middle East, but there's still that hate that says the Jewish nation cannot exist. And all the other people that are caught in the crossfire because of the hate of a few. And how generation after generation are still continually taught to hate But on this day, this day, this is our God. We have waited for him. He has saved us. This is the Lord we have waited for. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So yes, it's true. We live in a world that is angry and anxious, hate-filled and fearful. But it's not the last word and as followers of Jesus Christ having experienced salvation or perhaps not yet having experienced salvation this is something that we all look forward to this on this day Jesus the only one who can and the only one who will is going to restore all things So until that day, we wait and we rejoice 
And we'd be glad because salvation has come and salvation is still available. God still holds out his hand in invitation because he has not yet finished gathering in all his people. On this day, there's still an opportunity. On this day, this gift of transformation and life and forgiveness is still held out for all those who will repent and look to Jesus for their salvation. On this day, we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. On this day, we could celebrate your resurrection too. And I pray that it will be so as we wait expectantly and as we live our lives in the light of the greatest day, the greatest day yet to come in Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's respond with the words of, He is Lord.
Just to highlight for you from the newsletter, the saint that we're playing, praying for this week is Angeline Spreel. The student that we're praying for is Elena Walters. <clears throat> and the mission that we're praying for is Joy Church, Pastor Giuliano and his family in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, you also see the pack and play, playpen out in the lobby. Um, I trust that you all will read the newsletter and just fill it to overflowing with stuff for beginnings, which has now become day spring. Um, so um, I'll leave that in your hands. And if I don't think it's filling up fast enough, then I'll nudge you again. Uh, I'd like a personal prayer request for my sister-in-law, Jenny, who's in the hospital. Um, doctors are trying to figure out what's wrong, um, but they haven't done that yet. So I'd ask for you to please pray for Jennifer Taylor and her husband, Jamie. And I feel like I'm forgetting something. Maybe it'll come to me. <laughs> Let's bow our heads and quiet our hearts as we uh, pray with and for one another. Lord God, it's true. We live in a world that is in turmoil. But you are the God who is unchanging. You are the God who is a sovereign. You are the God who has conquered sin and death in Jesus Christ. You are the God who is bringing all things back to you in a perfect and wonderful and beautiful restoration and redemption. You are the God who still saves people, the God who still transforms lives, because you are the God who has not changed. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, gracious and compassionate, good and holy and just and right. And there is no salvation aside from you. And you give that salvation freely to people. And so, Father, we pray in the midst of this broken and turmoil-filled world, we pray to the one who holds it all in his hands. We pray, Lord Jesus, for our own community of faith, for those who are grieving and mourning, those who are dealing with illnesses, and we think of Wilma and Rob and the cancer that is ravaging their bodies and at the same time also their families. We pray for healing and strength and comfort in the midst of the uncertainty and probably even a little fear. We pray for hope and for the community of faith to come around in a show of support and encouragement. We pray for Anne and Annette and Jackie who deal with medical problems that are hopefully being taken care of but sometimes even confuse and uh, even the doctors cannot necessarily figure out what's wrong or that there's little that they can do and they simply have to live with pain and discomfort and the limitations. But you are the God who is not limited, the God who is not surprised or confused by any of this, but you hold them in your hands. We pray for my sister-in-law, Jenny, that the doctors would be given insight to figure out what is going on with her and for your healing touch to restore her and strengthen her and keep her family as well. 
We pray for Angeline over at Oxford Gardens. And we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would continue not only to fill her life with your presence, but we pray that all who come into contact with her would see the light of Jesus within her. We pray for Alana as she enters into the final weeks of the semester for all the work that has yet to be done. We pray, Lord God, for peace and perseverance and diligence and presence of mind just to move through all of these things one day at a time, one step at a time, and that the work that she does and the excellence that she pursues would be an offering of worship to you. We pray for Pastor Giuliano and Joy Church. We pray for your hand of blessing and protection to be upon him and he, as he and his family spread the good news amongst the people of Hamilton. We pray that you would continue to use him, Lord Jesus, to make disciples. And that their influence would be felt throughout the entire city and beyond. We pray for the world in which we live, the political and economic turmoil that we face in our own nation and in our neighbors to the south. Help us to daily remember, Lord Jesus, that salvation does not come from the offices of government. It comes from you. And we serve you first. And even as we are good citizens of these lands in which you have given to us, we pray, Lord Jesus, too, that our lives would shine with the light of God's grace and truth in Jesus Christ. For we confess again that you alone, Jesus, are the way and the truth and the life. We pray into our world as well <clears throat> for the people of Palestine and Israel, for our Israeli and Palestinian brothers and sisters in Christ, for all those caught in the crossfire. We pray for peace. We pray for healing. We pray for restoration. We pray for an end to the hate. We pray for the Prince of Peace <clears throat> to bring transformation into the situation and to restore. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia. Again, Father, for the evil that sees violence as the only way to solve any kind of situation or uses violence to take what does not belong to them. We look forward to the day, Lord God, when that violence and that hatred will be brought to an end. And we pray for that day to come soon. We pray for that day to be today. Of all days, Lord God, when your church worships and celebrates the resurrection of our Savior, of this new kingdom, we pray, Lord God, that it would bring an end to war and hostility and hate and conflict. We pray, Lord Jesus, for your church in the world. that your church would shine with the light and the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. We pray for our own church leadership, for the Regional Synod of Canada as they continue to make their way through the issues that are before them, preparing for General Synod this summer, for our Executive Secretary, Eddie Alleman, our General Secretary. We pray for wisdom to fill him and your protection to surround him 
for our Executive Secretary, Reverend John Campton, and his Regional Synod Board. In all these things, Lord God, we pray that your wisdom would prevail, that each of these would be blessed with discernment and a sight that goes far beyond today. We pray, Lord Jesus, once again that this day would not simply be another day. But that, Jesus, as you have risen in many hearts, that you would rise in many more. That many more would give their lives over to you to see you as Lord and Savior. For you alone are king and head of your church. And use your church in the world, Lord God, to display your grace and truth, your goodness and kindness. And we pray, Lord God, again, as you have always taught us, that your will would be done in heaven and in us and through us and on earth without question, without hesitation, joyfully, completely, and perfectly. For you alone are God, good and righteous and holy in all your ways. And we praise you alone, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior and King. Amen. Let's continue to worship together as we give our tithes and our offerings.
Father, we thank you again for how you have blessed us so that we may be a blessing in the world around us. We're reminded of the words of Scripture again, Lord Jesus, that you are the best that the Father had to give, and you, Father, gave it all in Jesus Christ. Help us to be generous then in your kingdom, Lord Jesus, as you have been generous with us. We pray especially today for the work of Tear Fund as they bring emergency disaster relief around the world and especially in Gaza. We pray, Lord God, that you would keep their workers safe, that the aid would get to where it is needed most, that lives would be saved, that people would be fed and nourished and clothed and given shelter in the midst of all this hostility and destruction. And we pray, Lord God, that their witness would not simply be one of giving aid, but also bringing the truth and the grace of Jesus Christ into each situation. Father, we thank you that you have achieved victory over sin and death. Help us each day to live in the confidence and the generosity of that victory. To the praise of our Savior Jesus, amen. Our closing song today is Because He Lives.
Friends, receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant to you his peace. Amen.